from the Regency Center in San Francisco. It's theCUBE, covering Serverless Conf, San Francisco 2018. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and this is theCUBE's coverage of Serverless Conf 2018 here in San Francisco, our second year doing the program, and happy to welcome back to the program Sam Cronenberg, who is the CEO and founder, the guy that built a cloud guru, the, the right. company behind this serverless comp show. So thanks yeah. so much for joining me, and uh, we, we really appreciate that uh, we can be here as a media partner. Thanks, Stu. Thanks for coming along. It's been uh, great. To, the conference has been great so far, and it's great to have you here. Yeah, so you know, serverless, one of those technologies we've been talking about for, for a few years, super exciting, a lot of energy, and I yeah. feel like it's, it's translating to the show. Good buzz yeah. to the show. I, I hear about it's 500 people, so give us, you know, the, compare and contrast for us a year ago to today. Yeah, there's huge energy here. This is the biggest turnout that we've had to date. Um, you know, we started this two years ago in 2016. I think we had a couple of hundred people. Um, mostly at that time it was the vendors, it was like, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and then some enthusiasts. I think last year, we started seeing more of the tooling companies, the startups around the serverless space starting to come in, and this year it's just exploded. I mean, if you if you have a look and you walk around and see the sponsor booths, there's just this explosion of uh, new tooling companies that uh, I guess doing value adds on top of what the vendors are doing. So, yeah, like security, monitoring, there's a whole, a whole range of them. Yeah, and, and Sam, you, you were the first one of the first companies I talked to where it was like, yeah. oh, okay, this, this technology that just allows me, you know, spend a few weeks in, you know, yeah. the basement building a company yep. um, that just totally changed the economics of how you yeah. build the company and how you deliver a service yep. uh, to, to, to users. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, uh, I built the original school in, in four weeks and uh, locked myself in a bedroom. And, uh, and because I built it serverless, not only was it cheap to run, but it scaled incredibly easily. I didn't have the operational overheads. If something, I didn't have to worry, uh, what if we get a spike in traffic in the middle of the night while I'm asleep, you know, when we didn't have a lot of staff. Um, and it, it allowed us to move quickly early on. Um, which was fantastic. Um, so there was a lot of like rapid development, test, and feedback cycles. Um, but interestingly, now I find one of the biggest differentiators for us is the cost. The cost is so low. Um, we do six and a half million Lambda invocations every day, um, 1.8 million API requests, and we pay $550 a month for compute for the entire business. 650,000 customers. Yeah, I mean, game changing on the economics. That is game changing, that is orders of magnitude. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, incredible. All right, um, a Cloud Group Guru as a, as a company uh, has expanded quite a bit. It's not yeah. just AWS anymore, yep. it's uh, beyond. Tell us a little bit about the, the company and uh, you know, give us your viewpoint of serverless overall. It's, it's much more than just Lambda today. Yeah, for sure, so the company as a whole, we're, yeah, we've grown like crazy, it's been great, we've expanded out. Um, we're in uh, Texas, in Austin, Texas now, um, and in the UK and in Australia. Um, yeah, we uh, we've a lot more focus uh, on other clouds as well. So we've just released our first Google certification courses. We've got a few Google courses, a whole bunch of Azure courses, and we're seeing a lot of demand within our customer base and enterprises that we work with to go multi-cloud. Um, so yeah, and I think the serverless space is is kind of a little bit by nature more um, vendor agnostic than the, the generic cloud computing space. It's, it's easier for companies to architect across clouds. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to, to, to dig into that a little bit for, for us because most of the people I talk to, yeah. it, it's pretty much dominated by Lambda today and some of the other yeah, services that AWS have. That is are true. you finding yeah. people that are doing serverless multi-cloud? There I was just there an announcement some. on that Knative stuff where we're all trying to dig into. So wh yeah. what do you see on the kind of non-Amazon serverless I front? I think everyone has their preference. And like, so we are mostly built on AWS, but we use Firebase as well, and we use Google Vision. And I think because when you build serverless, you're building against managed services effectively with APIs. But you know you can build against a managed service in AWS and hit its API, or you can hit one in Google, right? It, it, you've got that kind of boundary around the system. So yeah, you can, um, I, I think it's a little bit easier just by its very nature of being m m really, you're, you're building architecting on a set of managed services. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would say most companies are still focused 
uh, on particular clouds. But I just mean by nature, it's a little easier to, to right. build multiple. So, so you mentioned a couple of other services you're using. The, the, thing, the thing I want to ask you is, you know, so many times in technology, it's like, oh, when you're a startup, you can do the latest and greatest cool new thing. Yeah. And you built on Lambda. And then two or three years later, wait, wait, it's changed, and therefore, wait, I architected something differently. So give us your viewpoint as an architect yeah. as to how things have changed. You know, does using serverless allow you to just kind of be on the new thing easier than yeah. if I had, you know, kind of built oh, on servers? I'm actually talking about this in my talk tomorrow, and that's, I think, one of the big advantages of serverless is that you can change your architecture over time much more easily. So when we built, the when I built the platform originally, I built a monolith. It was a serverless monolith. There was like a whole bunch of functions reading to and writing from the same uh, database and just highly coupled. Um, and it was just this big kind of beast. Over time, as we brought on development teams, they didn't work anymore. They needed to be able to specialize in different areas. So we changed to a microservices architecture. We did that incrementally over time, but we never, we changed our entire architecture without ever once having to think about infrastructure. We didn't have to think about, uh, you know, what's the load balances, the web, how's the web farm going to work, how am I going to auto scale? Or, infrastructure was an issue, so changing our architecture is just a matter of changing a YAML file. Change a configuration file, hit deploy, CloudFormation deals with it. So I think it, it gives you that flexibility. Yeah, it, it, it's great. I mean, for years I used to talk about it, so, you know, well, when you build your infrastructure, well, what version of OS do you have? What yeah. you know, gear do you have? And if you go to AWS or Azure or GCP, you don't say what version are you running on because you're running on whatever they had. But That's even it. in traditional infrastructure as a service, it's not what version you're running on, but it's like, oh wait, I have this compute instance, and yep. now there's these new versions out, and how do I move exactly. and change, and there's yep. tooling to help with that, but yep. it sounds like you're saying uh, with, with well, the serverless and microservices, yeah. it makes that even easier. Well, even with cloud, like typical cloud, let's say instance-based, say EC2-based cloud, you know, if you want to introduce a new microservice, you've got to be thinking about, yeah, what, what's my entry point, how am I going to load balance, how am I going to set up my auto-scaling, we just don't, have to have those conversations. You know it's going to scale. Just expose an, in, expose a, an API endpoint or a Lambda function and just invoke it. And uh, I think, uh, who is it? Um, Rob from Nordstrom is doing a talk of from one to N. If you, with serverless, if what works for one invocation works for a million invocations. It just scales from one to N without any change in architecture. Yeah. Uh, that's I think that's the whole really scale compelling. thing that yeah. we've been talking about, but really it, it does, um, yeah, to, to talk a little bit, and, you know, you gave hmm. some stats as to scaling your business. You, yeah. you don't run any into limits or issues or, you know, spikes as I to... I think over time we've occasionally contacted AWS to increase like concurrent execution limits and some of that stuff, but, you know, if you just, you can see, you can pre-plan that, see that coming and, uh, and talk to them about it. But, like, we used to have to worry about, uh, you know, right and read throughput on DynamoDB, now they have auto-scaling, we don't have to worry about that. So I think a lot of those um, constraints that were there in AWS infrastructure are changing now too. So yeah, it's, it's something we have to do very, very rarely. Yeah, yeah uh, any commentary on the ma maturing space of serverless as to, you know, Hmm. Any limits that have been lifted, uh, you know, not just in Lambda, but in general, or uh, you know, th things that you're looking forward to, uh, you know, in the future that might expand some of the use cases or uh, you know, allow things to grow even faster. Uh, I think you know, obvious things like SQS Lambda integration is great to finally have it. So there's some things that would everyone was just waiting for, uh, kind of pre-existing things. Uh, no, I think. I think what's most interesting to me, like I, I get the vendors will keep innovating, they'll keep making things faster and more scalable and I, like tooling around that to make it easier to develop. I think we did an executive summit yesterday prior to the conference um, and one of the things that really uh, resonated to me in that summit was when you're a developer, a developer's entire experience of serverless is the dev experience. That's kind of all they see, like they're not, in the back-end infrastructure, worrying about you know the monitoring the servers and all of that kind of stuff, so that they're not looking so much at the ops. So their experience of serverless is the dev experience. So I think starting to see uh, the vendors focus on dev tooling, like Sam and having Sam local, and that is really great to see because that's improving experiences for developers. But I think the thing that excites me more than the vendors, what the vendors are doing is what the startup ecosystem is doing uh, in the, say, security space, um, monitoring, management. I know 
Serverless Inc. just announced their new product for the serverless platform for deployment. So I think that I kind of get a little bit more excited about that. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, of course, users that are doing cool and interesting things. I, I love yeah. to show you. you. Mentioned Nordstrom's is presenting. Uh, you know, I've heard them on podcasts before. Yeah. Uh, I had Fender on uh, today talk about how uh, serv serverless helps them uh, yep. in the application. Had uh, the people at serverless.com talking about how you know even in marketing and content, serverless uh, can, yep. can help them do. Any other uh, kind of cool, interesting stories that you could share? Yeah, I, I, I've seen like Expedia are doing a lot in the serverless space now. They're, um, they're doing a lot there. Um, another one, even Netflix. Netflix aren't using, from my understanding, they're not using uh, public cloud, but they've rolled their own, but they're using the same architectural principles and practices, so they have their own function as a service system built internally. So it's interesting to see the same patterns applied outside of public cloud where you know they may not make sense for them as a business to be, um, to be running uh, particular things in, in AWS, yeah. All so, right. yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's a, there's a range. Yeah. All right, Sam, I want to give you the final words, uh, takeaways from the show, and uh, what to look for from a Cloud Guru in the future. Um, well, yeah, we've got a whole lot more AWS content coming, a lot more labs, um, and a lot more um, Google and Azure content coming, so you just see a lot more really cool content from us, um, uh, a lot more focus, our focus now is a lot on uh, training teams at scale and enterprises. So we do a lot of work with uh, large enterprises on helping them transform their talent. So we're doing a lot of work on that. And yeah, I think tomorrow at the Serverless Conf show, we've got Simon Wardley. Um, I'm talking, so that, of course that'll be amazing. <laughs> um, no, we've got, a, we've got some really good, uh, Linda Nichols from CloudReach this afternoon, so I'm excited. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of cool content. Well, once again, Sam, really wanted to appreciate you, uh, the partnership, bringing, bringing the Cube here for the second year, uh, yeah. and congrats, great, great community year. Yeah, thank uh, you. you know, always a pleasure to catch yeah, up. Yeah, and thank you. you for supporting us. All right. Sam Cronenberg, I'm Stu Miniman, and uh, be sure to check out thecube.net for all of the content, uh, you know, for shows in the past as well as where we'll be in the future. Reach out to us if there's a show that we should be at that you don't see on the list. Uh, for the whole crew here, uh, most of them, the Palo Alto and San Francisco based. Uh, I'm an East Coast guy, but happen to be in the area. Uh, Stu Miniman, thanks so much for watching theCUBE.